Well, good evening. It's a joy to be with you again tonight in these days that we are together as we look at the life of Moses and his journey that God has called him out of the land of Sinai and brought him back to Egypt to bring his people out of bondage into the promised land. A journey that God has taken me also in the last couple of years of my own life and teaching me some lessons that he wanted me to learn and how to bring that also and teach that and preach that to our people back home in South Africa and also other parts of the world. You know, one time I was reading in the biography of Manly Beasley, in the introduction there was, it was mentioned that there was a, a question and inside the introduction and just some reference that if you want to grow in your walk with God, there's two things that you would need. And the one thing is that you need to surround yourself with like-minded people. People that have the same vision and the same burden and the same longing and desire that you have that God has put within your heart. You see, there are many Christian people all over the world. There are many people that is Christian people reading books and, and studying. But every now and then God gives you a friend or a, a companion that is a like-minded friend. That speaks about prayer the same way you speak about prayer. That pray the same way that you pray. That long for revival and spiritual renewal and awakening the same as you do. And those are the kinds of people that bring great encouragement in your walk with God as we pray for our nations, for us in South Africa and for you here in Canada in such a time as this and even all over the world. I find God has, has these unique people all over the world longing for the same kind of things. If you want to grow, that's the kind of friends that you would need to surround yourself with. Not just Christian people, but like-minded Christian people. Because there's a difference between the two. But the second thing that he said, that if you want to grow, is that you need to read good spiritual books. And as you know, there are many books on the market these days, in, in all the bookshops all over the world. But every now and then you find a nugget. A book that can really stretch your mind and touches your heart and and somehow create within your heart a desire to long for something better and more and, and draw you into a deeper walk and a deeper longing that God will do something for us. And I remember, just after I got saved many, many years ago, apart from the very first Bible I ever bought to myself was a set of books that I pick up in a bookshop in South Africa called They Knew Their God, Volume 1 through 6. It's just short nuggets inside about life stories of great men of God that God has used over the years in, in all the continents of the world. And that created a stirring within my heart. And I remember as I was reading some of those biographies, and, and every now and then when I, when I read some of those about the prayer life of George Mueller and his life of faith and his obedience and, and trusting God and a guy called Robert Murray McKeon and, and Hudson Taylor and all these wonderful people that God has raised up over the years, just a longing that came within my heart to become such a man as they were at the places where God has put them over the years. And ever since that time, I remember one of my hobbies in South Africa is to buy biographies and to read and to study and to see what was the secret of success of this man or this woman or somehow the journey that God has taken them and brought them to the place that made them such a man as they were in that moment. And I want to speak to you about some of those men tonight in connection with Moses and the journey that God has taken him by looking at a guy called Jonathan Goldforth and a man called Simeon Zimbambi from Uganda that God has used so mightily in the West or the East African revival many, many years ago. But I want us to turn back to the book of Acts chapter 7 as we have read together tonight already from verse 20 through towards the, verse, the end of verse 38. But I just want to draw your attention to a few verses of Scripture before we get to the message tonight. We have seen it's Moses who was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptian people and was mighty in words and deeds. And, and when he was 40 years old, how he... He tried to do something for his people but failed and how he had to flee for his life and fled into the desert. And, and after some time spending in the desert, our God came to him and, and spoke to him at the bush that was burning, as we have read together already. But I want you to see verse 35, as he said in the book of Acts chapter 7. And God said, This Moses, 
whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel? He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. And then I want you to see verse 37, because this is our theme for tonight and the message God has put upon my heart. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From your brethren, him you shall hear. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, And this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him in the mountain of Sinai. You know, when you look at Moses and the journey that God has taken him, spending some 40 years in the desert because of a mistake by killing a man, even though he knew that God wanted to use him to bring the people out of bondage. Now he spent 40 years in the desert realizing that maybe God somehow has forgotten about him with a dream that was within his heart that has died, or that's the way it seemed to him. And we have looked already this last few days that we are together at God's eternal purpose that God had in mind, even for Moses, and God's plan that he had put together already by bringing the people from bondage out of Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land, and eventually for us as Christian people, not just to be saved and born again, and to be filled with the fullness of the Spirit, but to become more and more into the image and the likeness of His Son, which take place in the promised land, in our work with God. And last night we looked very briefly at the place that God has in mind for Moses. We looked very briefly at the encounter at the bush that was burning, and the path that God has in mind for Moses, starting by reminding him about his past, about the shoes that he was wearing that he had to take off from his feet. But tonight I want us to look at the man that God wants to use in such a time as this from some of these passages that we have read together, but especially from the book of Exodus in chapter 3. But from God's perspective and not from the perspective of Moses. And I believe there are many more probably characteristics and examples that we can look at to see what we would need in order for us to become a man or a woman of God after his own heart in a day like today. But just to continue what we are doing ever since Sunday morning in the same frame of mind, I want us to look at Exodus chapter 3 once again, but this time from the perspective of God. You know, China had many, many great men of God over the years. William Burns and David Hill and Hudson Taylor and, and there are so many other people like Isabel Keene and even Oswald Sanders and, and John Sung. But then there was Jonathan Goforth. He was a Canadian, just like you guys tonight, which is Canadian citizens. He was a Presbyterian, a Reformed pastor that God sent as a missionary to China many, many years ago and how God used him in revival amongst the Chinese people. But there was a time in his life that he went through a barrenness in his soul. And he said about that in his own book, he said, There was about 13 years in my life that I was barren in my spiritual life. And by October 1932, by that time, he has read through the New Testament in a Chinese language more than 50 or 60 odd times by that time. The last 19 years of his life, he went through the Scriptures 55 times. Sometimes in the English language and sometimes in the Chinese language or the Mandarin as he had to learn to speak that. But even though reading through the Bible more than 60 times in the last 19 years of his life, he testified by saying that there was a barrenness in my soul, in my walk with God. And in that time, he received somebody sent him a book to read about Charles Finney and the biography of Charles Finney. But he speaks about the law that we need to... Uh, that there are specific laws that we can somehow obey or maybe get to the point of, of paying the price for that. And God can use these laws in a spiritual harvest and send a revival. And he said, if there are specific things that we can do to see revival, that's what we will do. But then somebody sent him also the book from R.A. Torrey about the Holy Spirit. And he started to study the life and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
And for about six months, day by day and week after week, he was reading through the testimonies and the teachings of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and came to the point of surrendering himself by asking God to fill him with the fullness of the Holy Spirit and then use him as a missionary in Canada, but not just there, but in China, especially where God has placed him. Because he sensed there was a barrenness in his soul, even reading through the Scriptures so many times, day after day, and week after week throughout this whole year, because something was missing. And after six months of praying for the Holy Spirit to touch him and just to fill him afresh and anew with the fullness of himself, he came to this point of asking God to start to use him. But in that time, Jonathan Goforth had to go on a mission trip from the southern parts to the northern parts to visit all the mission stations. But around that time, the reports started to come all the way from South Korea about the revival that God was sending in the land in the nation of Korea, longing for God to do the same thing in China. But as he was preparing to travel to the next place the next day, he asked God to touch him and to fill him with the fullness of himself. And God said, you can travel tomorrow to go to the next place, but I will not go with you. Because there's something wrong between you and me. There's a disagreement between you and one of your elders inside the local church. And he said, Lord, you know, if I look at the elder, it's, it's not me. I know there's a disagreement, but this time the disagreement between the elder and myself was because of the elder. And, and if somebody has to fix the problem, it's him. And God said, I know that he was the cause of the problem, but I am speaking to you. I want you to go and fix the problem with the elder before you travel tomorrow to the mission station on a missionary outreach and a preaching engagements. And as he was struggling with that, he came to the point of surrendering late that evening. And as he walked towards the house of the elder, he found that the lights were still on. He knocked on the door. And as he was speaking to the man, they were reconciled with one another. And the very next day, as he traveled on a missionary outreach, come to the place of preaching just a simple message as he normally, normally were preaching in that time, God just showed up. And as he was preaching here, make the invitation. He said, those who want to make right with God tonight, why don't you just stand up for a brief moment where you are sitting? And the whole congregation just stood up. He said, maybe you did not hear the question understood correctly, so please just sit down and those who want to make right with God tonight and meet with God, why don't you stand? And the whole congregation stood again and he said, no, maybe there's something wrong with the invitation. And as he looked backwards to the elders and the deacons to see that maybe they, they can help him to convey the message and invitation better, he saw that the elders and the deacons were lying in their faces just weeping and confessing their own sin. And God just shows up. The beginning of the revival in 1932 in Manchuria, in China, all because of a Canadian Presbyterian pastor and minister as a missionary that came to the point of realizing, even though I went through the Scriptures and I studied the New Testament, up to 60 times in the last five, six years of his life, there was a barrenness in my soul. And today as we look back, that's why I like to read biographies so much about men of God that God has used in the days gone by. Because as you look at Jonathan Goforth and R.A. Torrey from America and D.L. Moody and, and all these great men from South Africa and America and worldwide, we, we can look at their biographies and their life stories and realize it was just a simple man just like you and I tonight that somehow God has touched their lives and used them to become a blessing for so many people. You know, Charles Spurgeon used to say that you live your life forward, but you understand it backwards. And as we look at the life of Moses in the book of Exodus tonight, we find that Moses was meeting with God at the bush that was burning. We think about that time of, of preparation that God had in mind for him in that desert time of 40 years. It reminds me of Joseph that was a slave in the prison and working in Egypt for more than 13 years. You think about Paul tonight living in the desert for almost like three years as a preparation. We think about the Lord Jesus tonight who spent 40 days in the desert. We think about Moses. I think about John Sung tonight who studied in America and became a doctor in physics. And then God saved him and God called him. 
to become a missionary to his own people in China. And as he started to speak to his professors about the Lord Jesus, they thought that he was crazy. And they put him inside a hospital for crazy people. And God said, I want you to stay there for six months because this is part of your preparation. You see, sometimes failures and disruptions in life and disappointments and solitude is a preparation for God, what God wants to do, just like in the case of Moses. But God used that time of John Sung. He read through the Bible 40 times in six months. And every time from a different perspective. When he came from the hospital after six months, that was his Bible study. That was the course that he went through. And as he was preaching in China, God sent revival. So we can look at these biographies tonight, the great men of God from days gone by and see where they have been and what they have become. And I want us to look tonight at the life of Moses from this perspective from the book of Acts chapter 7 where the Bible speaks, when he speaks about Moses, he said, but this is that man, Moses, whom God spoke to and met in the mountain of Sinai through the angel. This is that Moses. What Moses? Which Moses? And maybe a question tonight for you as I think about that. Could it be that God somehow want to look down from heaven to this sanctuary tonight in Canada, in Ontario, and touch maybe your heart and your mind and your life, whether it's old or young, and say, one, I want to change your name tonight. You see, God's man over the years have come to the point of meeting with God, allowing God to change your name. And I wonder if God doesn't want to change your name tonight. You see, in the Old Testament, Moses was just called Moses, the greatest prophet of all. But in the book of Acts chapter 7, God is using one or two verses by referencing his name with a small change. And calls him this Moses. The one who met with me in the desert. Maybe in the years to come. Ten years down the road from now. Maybe 15 years down the road. Maybe 20 years from now when you look back in your own life. Reading your own biography. Writing your own story from today onwards for the rest of your life. Maybe 10 years from now. Your family will look at this moment and say, there was a moment where God met with Francois and changed his name from Francois to this Francois. Maybe tonight can be the beginning of a new biography in Canada. I would love to come back in 10 years from now. Maybe not so long, maybe. It's been five years since I've been in this area. But if you come back five years down the road or ten years and to see what God has done in revival. Do you see Genesis to Revelations is God's story? We think because the country is changing and the politics and the economy and, and people are changing and become more worldly and liberal worldwide and God's work has stopped worldwide and we just have to wait for the second coming of Christ to go back home. And God said, listen... From Genesis to Revelation, it's still my story. And, and I'm still putting my hand and my finger upon the lives and the hearts of people, calling them unto myself to go and to do my work and to preach my gospel. And even beyond that, I still want to change your name and use you for my benefit and for my glory. I want us to look at Moses tonight very briefly, but from God's perspective in the book of Exodus chapter 3. You know, when God called Moses... In verse 10 he said, Come now, therefore I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God met with Moses at the bush that was burning. God reminded him of his past. God spoke to him about his shoes, and the place that he was standing was holy ground. And God called him by name, and, and God re reminded him of so many things. And then God said, Listen, Let's just repeat what we started about 40 years ago. I want you still to go back to Egypt and get my people out of, of Egypt and bring them to this mountain because we have to make our way towards the promised land, the land of milk and honey. But as you know, Moses had a few ex excuses. And I remember when I was here with you a few years ago, I, 
I, one evening I spoke about this. But tonight I want us to look at this from God's perspective. Look what Moses was saying to God in verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? You know, Moses had the excuse that he could not go because who am I? Because when he was the second in command of the armies of Pharaoh, in the son of the daughter of Pharaoh, he was the man in the position to lead out the people from bondage in Egypt, but he failed. So Moses still has this mindset in his mind that you need to become the leader of the land in order for you to bring the people out of bondage. But I want you to see the answer God gave to Moses. So God said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. What does it mean? You see, all of us tonight have family members. The message of Sunday morning, which is not saved and born again. We all have family members and friends who is saved but is walking and living a life of defeat and failure in the desert. We all have family members and friends who is not living in the promised land, the land of rest and victory, but addicted to pornography and alcohol and cigarettes worldwide and, and to be a, 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 have a good reputation and maybe somehow addicted to finances and whatever the case might be tonight. We all know people worldwide that God is bringing across our ways and paths day by day that God wants to send us to, to bring a blessing to them that God can lead them out of bondage through the wilderness into the promised land. Starting with our own families tonight. Then somehow God looked down from heaven and He said, Francois, I have come down, I have seen the affliction of your people, your friends and your family members in South Africa, your colleagues all over the world. Therefore, I have come down to do something about this and I want to use you. But before you can go, I need to change your name. With five things. Number one. I want you, first of all, to look at this commission from my perspective in verse 11. You ask the question, who am I? That I should go to my family members and my friends and, and my neighbors and my colleagues at work. And, and uh, who am I? And God said, listen, Moses, I will be with you. You see, Moses was having a focus problem. Because inside this verse of Scripture, there's a number of truth that we need to understand tonight. God said, Moses, forget about yourself for a brief moment. Forty years ago, you tried, but you failed. I want you to look at this now from my perspective. I, this, this time, I will be with you. This time, I I'm going to go with you. And there will be a sign as well. You'll come back to this mountain to serve me. But you need to understand something. You need to look away from yourself. You need to look away from your own abilities and your own preaching and your own way of doing things. And I want you to look at me. Look at me, God Himself. Because I, this time, will be with you. You know, when... Um, in January this year, when I was taking my daughter to New Zealand to drop her off at, uh, at the Bible school in Cape Henry in New Zealand, you know, for the last several years of my life, I've been traveling away from my home week after week preaching about revival in South Africa. And, and I, I've come accustomed to the fact that I only see my family on Thursday nights and Fridays and Saturdays and sometimes even less than that. And, and somehow my wife has become not just the mother, but the father at home because he takes my place for the benefit of my daughter. And because I've said goodbye so many times at the airports, it was easy for me to think that I'm going to drop off my daughter in New Zealand and just leave her there for a year. And, and that's okay because we have done that so many times. And I remember one day as I got back home after a preaching engagement, I saw my wife and my daughter 
inside the bedroom and I saw the door was closed and I, as I peeped around the corner, I saw that they were just inside the bedroom. They were inside the, the bathroom and my wife was sitting inside the top and my daughter was just sitting next to her and they, they were just talking and I, and I could see that my wife was just weeping and crying because in the next two or three days, Lune will board the plane and fly all the way to New Zealand. And I just closed the door and walked away because I sense my wife need time to, to let go. You know, we arrived in New Zealand. We stayed at the house of a family member in Pukakole, south of Auckland, just outside, not too far away from Hamilton. And one morning as my daughter went for a walk with a lady of the house, I was having my quiet time, and as I was reading that time for the book of Matthew, it's the beginning of the year, so I started fresh in Matthew, and, and as I came to chapter 26, in the time when Jesus found himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, that passage said, and Jesus became sorrowful. And he said, Father, if this cup can go past me, but not my will, your will be done. And as I reading that sorrow, and about this cup, I suddenly saw my daughter, just like the father saw Jesus. And he gave his son, and I have to give my daughter. And God just broke my heart. And as I was sitting in that bed just weeping, I just wept. And I remember as I got up from that place of prayer and weeping, I went to take a shower. And as I was showering, I was just weeping and weeping. It's almost like I, I cannot explain that to you. But luckily for the shower, there was a sound so nobody could hear. You know, as I went back, my daughter was not finished yet and walking with the family, the lady from the family, and she came back. And, but before she came back, I went off the shower back to my bed, and as I continued reading and praying, I came to Matthew chapter 28, the very last verse. God said, Lo, I am with you. And as I read that, God spoke to me. He said, Francois, I. I am with your daughter. I am with your wife. It's all about me. Remember the story in the Old Testament when the prophet Elijah, when the Syrian army was fighting against the people of Israel, and as he walked outside, the servant, he saw the, the great masses of people. He came inside. He was so afraid. And the prophet said, Lord, would you just open his eyes in verse 16 that he can just see that those who are around us and with us is so much more than what we see in this moment, because I am here. You see, sometimes we fail because we, our focus is completely wrong. It's time for us to readdress the issue of our focus. And as I look at all these biographies of men of God, it's men and women that has become God conscious. God conscious. You know, when Mary became pregnant with the baby Jesus, in that moment when the angel came to visit with her and said, Listen, you are favored by God, you have found great mercy, and you will be the one. Mary said, How can this be? How can this be? Because I knew no men. We're not married yet with Joseph. How can this be? that I will get pregnant with the Messiah, the baby Jesus. You know, when you grew up in that area, there was the anticipation the whole time that somehow people from this region, from this community will be the one which is the chosen one, the young lady. I can just imagine if you grew up in Galilee and, and you studied the Old Testament and the New Testament, by that time, some part of what they had and there was discussions day after day and week after week after the rabbi was preaching on the Sabbath day and they come back and they talk about the fact that the Bible tells us in this community, in this area, somebody will become the mother of the Messiah. Jesus. Imagine if God somehow would send a prophecy to this community, to this lighthouse gospel, and say one of these young girls here tonight will be the mother of the next Billy Graham in Canada. The great D.L. Moody. The John Sung, the Jonathan Goforth. 
Oh, the Simeon in Zimbabwe of East Africa in Uganda. I can just imagine the anticipation that will be in this community. As you grow up as a young girl, looking at the boys, maybe if we can date somehow when you are 18 or 19 and get married, and, and maybe there's a baby coming along the way, that he might be the one. So Mary lived with the same expectation. And then the angel came and said, you are the one. How can this be? He said, Mary, you need to change your focus. You tend to think about getting pregnant like the normal people get pregnant. What's going to happen with you is coming from the Holy Spirit. But before you understand that, I want you to look up, he says. I have been sent by God the Almighty to you, to speak to you. You have a focus problem. Forget about Joseph for a brief moment and getting pregnant. Start to focus on the one who is speaking to you now. God himself. The power of the Almighty will overshadow you today. You see, we tend to look at the command and then our own abilities. God said, forget about your abilities. Forget about the commission, the command. I want you to start focusing on me. I am with you. But then Moses, you know, he went through the motions like we all do. We all have these excuses. And look at the next verse. So he said, Then Moses said to God, verse 13, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers have sent me. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? So Moses had the second excuse because he was fearing rejection. Because the last time that he was there, he tried and he failed. But God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am as sent you. And then from verse 15 till the end of verse 22, you should read that in your own time. When God spoke to Moses, he said, this you shall say to the children of Israel, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. Because this is my name forever. You see, one of the meanings of I am means I am eternal God. I am faithful. It's time for me to do what I have promised to the people of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob so many years ago. You see, the man whose name is changed is a man that God or has allowed God to start to work in his life and standing on the promises. Of God. And not just the promises of God, but allowing God to set the agenda of his life. You see, Moses was trying to figure out a way how to go back and tell the people. But God said, Forget about that for a moment. Think about my promise, what I have said that I will do to Abram, Isaac. In Jacob, Because remember Moses, in Genesis, right through Revelations, is my story. And you are part of my story. And I want to use you. You just become a part of history. But I want you to start living your life based upon my word and my promise. Because I've given you my book, my word, and my promise. And I want to set the agenda. And then if you read verse 16 and verse 17 and verse 18... God tells him exactly what's going to happen when he goes back to Egypt. Let me ask you something tonight. Does God set the agenda of your life? You know, as I was reading through the study in the life of the Lord Jesus, I told you the last night that Every month of December, I read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking at the life of Jesus. One time as I was reading through these Gospels, I, I started just to look at the relationship that Jesus had with his Father. In one of those verses in the book of John, chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible tells us that Jesus said, 
But the Son of Man can do nothing except what he sees from his Father. So Jesus is looking to his Father to set the agenda of his life, to set the tone of the day. How do I know that? And if you understand this simple principle of Jesus doing only what his Father told him and, and showed him, and if you read the Gospels again, you see how many times Jesus changed the course of his life and his agenda. Even in Mark chapter 1, after praying a day, his Father summons him to the mountain to go to pray in the night, and, and he changed the course of direction through Samaria in John chapter 4. His whole life was set according to the agenda of his Father. Because verse 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 and 22, God gave a detailed plan for Moses to show him what's going to happen in Egypt when he goes back. Because Jesus was living his life set upon the word and the promises and the agenda of his Father. Does God control your agenda tonight? You know, Duncan Campbell, as he was preaching one time, God spoke to him so clearly and said, you need to walk away from the pulpit right now. And Duncan Campbell just got up from his seat as he was sitting in that moment and he walked away from a service like this and got onto a boat and he sailed to the Hebrides and he started to preach and God sent revival because God set the agenda. When was the last time you prayed about your program for tomorrow? You see, people whose names are changed live their lives according to God's Word. Not just the Bible, God's Word. There's a difference between the two. And His promises and His agenda. Moses. This Moses has become this Moses when he changed his mind. Allowing God to set the agenda. What is in God's heart tonight for you and your family? And for the next week and the next month. But you know, Moses, he continued to say no. He said, Lord, if you look in chapter 4, verse 1, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me. Or listen to my voice. Suppose they will say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? And he said, A rod. And God said, Cast it to the ground. And he cast it to the ground. He became a serpent. And Moses fled. And you can read verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7 and, and verse 8 and, and verse 9. God doing a number of miracles. You see, Moses was struggling with doubt. And unbelief. But a man whose name is changed is a man who has become a man of faith and trust. Trusting God. There's a difference between faith and trust. Am I right? We all believe God can do miracles. Then God said, Trust me. We all believe God can provide for us. Then God said, trust me. You know, I've realized in the last couple of weeks as Dorothy and myself were spending some time, 40 days of fasting and feast, seeking the face of God for specific things in South Africa. We came to the realization that we have unbelief in our belief and trust. I mentioned the name of Manly Beasley tonight in the very beginning of the service. You know, he became sick. Different diseases and cancer. And God asked him a question, do you want me to heal you? Or do you want me to keep you alive? And he said, Lord, if you heal me tonight, I will tell everybody tomorrow what you've done for me. But for the next three, three or four or five weeks or three months, I will do so. But then I will forget about that because we are only human. I want you to keep me alive. Because that's the greatest miracle. You should read the biography and see how day by day how God has led him into a life of faith and trust. And one time, 600,000 American dollars of medical bills that needs to be paid in one year. They never ask for money. He wrote a few things about prayer and faith. There's intellectual faith, he says. There's emotional faith. And then there's volitional faith. 
But I told Henry as I came on Friday that he wrote a definition of faith. He said, faith is to act upon the belief a thing is so when it is not so in order for it to be so because with God it's already so. so. When you get up from your knees, it's finished. God has answered and prepared and provided already. You know, one time I read the story of a, a pastor called one of his friends that was living in Moldale Baptist Church in Louisiana. They were praying together for three days about the upcoming conference. And, and as they were praying together towards the end, they, they trust the Lord to provide and all the food and the finances and the means for the conference for three or four days in Moldale and take care of all the needs. And, and as they came together, Manly asked him, how much are you trusting the Lord for for the weekend? And he mentioned the number, figure of finances that God needs to send in to pay all the bills over the weekend. So Sunday morning they took up the love offering. And as they have the money right in front of them, Manly Beasley walked to the front and said, inside that bag is let's say five or ten thousand American dollars for the cost of the weekend without counting the money. Because he said, if you believe that's what God has said, then it is settled. Without counting the money. So as they opened the bag, they found exactly the same amount as they said. You see, sometimes we only want to open the bag first to count, and then we will tell. He walked to the front and to all, all the people inside that bag is that amount of money. And if it was not so, he'll make a fool of himself. But he said, faith is to act upon the belief that it is so because God said so. You see, a man whose name is changed is a man who's standing not just on the promises of God, but a man who has come from the point of having faith and belief in God, in trusting what God is said and is going to do. Do you believe God can provide? The answer is yes. Do you trust Him for the impossible? You see, there's a man called Caleb in the Old Testament. And as he was sent out with all the spies in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, they came back and they tell Moses, you see, there's a lot of things happening in the promised land. And, and even Joshua was favorable. He said, we have to go back. And I know there's giants, but God has given this land to us already. It's ours for the taking. And you know the story how they end up in the desert because of the unbelief of ten. But you know, in the book of Joshua, chapter 14, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9, when Joshua was dividing the land, Caleb came to Joshua in chapter 14, verse 6, and he said the following. He said, give me that land that God has promised me in Numbers, chapter 13, because I'm still standing on the promises of God. And by faith, I'm going to go inside and inherit my promise, even though there is giants. Moses, you must allow me to change your name from a man that believe I can to a man that trust me. And that's the difference. Do you trust him? Or you just have belief that God can? Or faith in what God can do? Or do you trust Him? You see, trust means to lean on. To lean on. To lean in and to lean on. And to put your full weight upon something. Like the Lord Jesus. You know, when Peter looked at Jesus as he walked on the water, he was able to walk. But the moment you look at the things around him, he was sinking. So God said, Moses, I want you not just to believe in me. I want you to come to the point of trusting me this time. Because I, God, has given you my word based upon my promise. And I want to set the agenda by sending you, but you will have to go by faith in trusting me to do the impossible. 
Are you willing, he says. And as we read together tonight in Acts chapter 7, God said, Ah, oh, this is that Moses who allowed me to change his name to a man of trust. Do you trust him? Even though you cannot see anything, trust. Oh, Moses was still struggling. Look at the next few verses in verse 10. He said, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And oh, we know that Moses was lying. We read that together tonight in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, 25. And Moses was well educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and could speak well. You know how to speak. You know how to point the finger, to criticize, tell a story and a joke, and to be the man in a conversation. But now as he was standing before God, he said, Lord, I, I cannot speak. And so the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth and who has made the mute and the deaf, the seeing and the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what to say. God speaks about two things. Didn't Jesus say in the book of Luke that don't be afraid when you appear before kings and governors in the world. It will be told to you what to say. At the same time, he speaks about somebody inside him that will tell you what to say. He speaks about God himself in you. And we can only come to this point as we surrender unto him. He speaks about the fullness of himself, the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, he speaks about getting our words from God. It reminds me about the life of the Lord Jesus in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 28, and chapter 12, verse 48, where Jesus said, But the Son of Man can only speak what the Son of Man has heard from the Father. So Jesus said, I can only speak what I've heard from my Father. And now God said, I will tell you what to say. In other words, Moses, you have to slow down the message from last night and you have to make time to listen because before you can speak, I tell you to say what you need to say, but in order for you to do that, you have to listen. And how do we listen is when we stop and slow down and spend time and listen as we sit at the feet of our Father, in this case, the Lord Jesus, with the Bible as we read and as we listen. So Jesus is saying, Father, I can only speak what I've heard from my Father. And every one of these verses of Scripture, as I realize that, every one of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the red letters that Jesus spoke, He said, I got that from my Father. I will tell you how to speak to your wife and your husband and your family members, and the unsaved ones, and those in the wilderness, and those in the promised land, and, and those that I will send you to because I am preparing a way for you to speak to them. I will tell you what to say, but you have to make time to slow down and to sit and to listen before you can speak. Let me ask you something. Can you honestly say that what came from your mouth today you got that from your father. Think about that for a moment. When you open your mouth, you got that from your father. That pointing finger, that criticizing, that slander, that joke, the harshness of the words, the jealousy, the things we say, the things we do. Jesus said, I got that from my father. God said to Moses, I will give you something because I will be your mouth. And before we will allow God to speak through us, we have to surrender to him. That speaks about the fullness of God and at the same time his word. You see a man whose name is changed is a man who's allowing God 
to take him on a journey and to become his all in all. That's the ultimate goal of Christianity. That God be all in all. In you and through you, even the way we speak. But before we can do that, we have to listen. And before we will listen, we have to make time and to surrender our agendas and our lives. You see, a man whose name is changed is a man who has surrendered his all, that God can be all in all. But even that moment, Moses was struggling. And then he came to the point of almost missing it. He said, Lord, look at verse 13. Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Choose somebody else. You see, a man whose name is changed is a man who is not letting an opportunity to be used by God and be a blessing go to the wayside. You know how many times God has touched the hearts of people worldwide, sitting in a gas station, in a truck stop, in a supermarket, in a church building, in a shopping mall, in an aeroplane, and touch your heart, invite you to join Him, to bring blessing to people. And we said no. We missed the blessing. He almost missed it. But partly he did. Because God then said, there is your brother Aaron that also speaks about the Holy Spirit. But there's your brother Aaron. He's on his way to you already. But you know when the people sinned against God in the book of Exodus chapter 32. And God sent Moses down from the mountain. Moses did three things in the camp. He looked at the problem, and part of the problem was his brother, Aaron. And he spoke to his brother, he said, why did you allow this to happen? And Aaron said, but the people made me do this. You see, if Moses in the beginning did not say no to God completely, God might have not chosen another. So the calf was partly Moses' problem. Maybe the problems you experience tonight in your walk of God, in your ministry, in your finances, in your family, in your marriage, is because maybe one time you said no to God. And God had to find another that became the problem in your life. In Numbers chapter 12, in one moment, Aaron looked at his sister Miriam and said, Does God only speak to Moses? And God called them together and he said, Listen, I kind of would like to speak to you too, but you're not there. You see, Moses almost missed it. But a man whose name is changed by God is a man that sees the opportunity to become a blessing. You know, one of the things that I'm praying for while I'm here on my prayer list in Canada, is that God would set the divine appointments for me. That God inside me and through me become a blessing for people while I'm here in the homes I'm staying. And sometimes we mess up and we miss opportunities. That's true. But not to miss the opportunities. Because that will change your name. When people look at you, they will remember there was a moment. And God touched my heart. I have to close. My time is finished. You know, there's a man, his name is Simeon Zambambi. He was a black man from East Africa. It all started with a man called Dr. Joe Church in that moment in Uganda. Joe Church was a missionary doctor all the way in Rwanda. And a mission station called Gahini. And then there was a drought and there was no rain for almost like a year in the north eastern parts of Rwanda. And all the people start to flee down and towards Uganda because there was rain and there was harvesting and there was food and there was jobs available for the people. 
And Joe Church said there was a time as a missionary doctor that more than a thousand people per day went through the Gahini Hospital on the way to Uganda. He said some of them just came for miles and for miles and for days and for days without any food. And, and some just was just crawling into the mission station and just simply died. And after one year of helping people like that and sick people and, and dying people and they were struggle with food and he was just dropped dead tired and burned out. So he took a break for a couple of weeks and went all the way to Entebbe, Kampala in Uganda to rest. And one Sunday morning as he was walking towards the church, on Namirembe Hill was the place just outside Entebbe. He walks toward that building and there was a black man that walked towards him. His name is Simeon Nzambambi. And he said, sir, I recognize you. A few months ago you were preaching at a Bible study and you spoke about the full surrendered life. And I remember what you said that day. I made some notes and I went back and I gave me all to Jesus. But somehow something seems to be missing in my life. There's a barrenness. And Joe Church said the following. He said, you know, I've been working so hard. And, and I've come to this place to rest. But in my heart, and in my mind, there's just this longing for a fresh touch and a fresh meeting and an encounter with God. So for the next two days, they came together in a small little room where they stayed. And they read through the Scriptures, the Old Testament, and they look at the New Testament, and they look at every verse of Scripture that they could find reading together about the Holy Spirit and the fullness of God Himself in and through them. And after two days of just sitting and reading and listening to one another, they were kneeling together at the bed, black and white. And as they were kneeling, they were praying. And as they were praying, they were surrendering themselves completely into the hands of God. One was a medical doctor wanting a fresh touch. The other one was a simple worker from the state government department of medical health. An official with a very good job. A high paid salary. Wanting to have more of Jesus. Two different people, two different emphasis with the same need. You know, a few days later, Simeon stood up and he sold his house. He sold his vehicle. He bought himself a jacket. And he started to walk down the streets of Entebbe and Kampala and preaching the gospel by asking people only one question. Are you saved? With two different meanings. The one do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you born again? Are you saved from your sins? Do you go to heaven when you die? And then you look at the Christian people. He said, listen, are you saved from yourself? Is God all in all in you? Does he control? Does he sit on the throne of your heart? Two questions. In fact, only one of two meanings. A few days later, one of the people came to Joe Church and said, Listen, what have you done with Simeon Zimbabwe? He said, What do you mean? He said, Because he's different. He's a different person. He has changed. And he started to preach. And the people from the church gave a nickname to Simeon Zimbabwe and those people that start to follow him. Every Friday they had Bible study, 40 people and more. And so it spread all over the east of Africa, today known as the East African Revival. You know what was their nickname? It was Balakole. It is the saved ones because something has happened in the heart of the Christian people. They start to live and speak as if they are saved all over again. Ah, oh, this is that Simeon Zimbabwe. It could be you tonight. Let's start to live and start to speak and whose name will be changed if you allow God to do so.
You see, Moses was just Moses in the desert. But then there was a moment when he met with God. And God took him on the path last night, and I gave you some points. But tonight God spoke to Moses and said, listen, I want you to start focusing your life on me. That one that's inside you, Jesus Christ that you have accepted, it's me. Because Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. God the Father is living his life through his Son and by the working of his Spirit in us and through us. But we live as if God is still up in heaven. God said, allow me to give you a word and a promise and an agenda. Allow me to change your faith into trust. Allow me to fill you with the fullness of myself. Allow me to speak through you. Allow me to create the opportunities for you to change your name and be used by me. Let me ask you something tonight. What is your name? What do you want your children and your grandchildren to say about you? when you are not here anymore, that you were the elder, the deacon, that you have so much property and so much money? Or will they look at you and see that you are a man of peace, a man of prayer, a man of faith? Or will they look at you and see, but there was a moment that God met with my father and he changed my father's name. Not Jacob anymore. It's Israel. Not Moses anymore. It's this, it's that Moses. Not Francois. It's that Francois. That God can use. It's not Jonathan Goforth anymore. It's that Jonathan Goforth. It's not Simeon Zambambi. Oh, it's Balakole, Simeon and Zambambi. Henry. No, that Henry. So God is standing before you tonight, ever since Sunday morning. And he will continue tomorrow night and Wednesday night to show you what can be if you allow him to do that in you and through you, old or young. It's not too late. Two old ladies, one was 80 years old, one was 84 years old in the Hebrides. One was blind. The other one was filled with arthritis, arthritis. And God used them to become these two ladies that prayed down a revival in the Hebrides. A medical doctor in Rwanda. A black official in Uganda. A Presbyterian pastor in Canada. A shoemaker in Chicago. America, a mine worker in Wales, and so we can go on. What about you tonight? God says, when you look at your life, in years to come, what do you want me to say about you? A man that has lived his life focused upon God until the very end whose name is changed. Let us pray together. Father, as we come together tonight, Lord, you know what you have spoken to us about tonight. Maybe it's our agenda. Maybe it's the way that we speak to our family members and friends. Maybe it's about just trying to be in control of our own lives. And, or maybe we struggle with unbelief disbelief like Moses or maybe Lord we are living our lives thinking that God can only see on Sunday at Bible study maybe on Wednesday not realizing that I am with you every second of the day that we can live in the fullness of the power and the glory of God day by day and Father, tonight, 
I believe with my whole heart that you can find a young man or a young girl or any man or any woman tonight, old or young, that you can just lay your finger upon that is willing to say like Moses, Lord, I'm willing. I do not know how. I've got no idea when and where, but I'm willing to go wherever you want to send me. A family member, a friend, and to be used by you. But I just want to live my life in the fullness and the glory of God, in me and through me, for his benefit and for his glory. So, Father, I pray that even as we come to the close of the meeting tonight, Lord, that you would continue to speak and to stir and to draw us unto yourself, even right throughout this night, whatever the cost might be, that we would come to that point and say, Yes, Lord, take off the shoes to surrender the staff and the rod as we accept the commission and the calling, either to go or just to be, but sick and tired of living in failure, failure day by day, missing something in our hearts and lives. Because with you there is so much more that you want to give to us. So, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and even, Lord, that you would bring us to the place and the point of surrender that we can say, yes, Lord, irrespective of the cost that you can be in all and all, in and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Henry.